Good morning, everyone. It's good to see a great crowd. I know everybody's supposed to be, you know, excited about this topic, but it is early in the morning, and it is uh, what both Jeremy and I are talking about uh, are the details of federal programs, which means, you know, they're uh, complicated to a certain extent. Jeremy get a, gave a great um, presentation that gave you the simplified steps, but as you know, as you get into the details, things get more complicated. And I'm going to be talking about uh, other state programs that do the same. First, what I would like to do is just give you um, a speck of information about uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture and how they think about risk management. They uh, do a lot of stats collection. Uh, there are m many agencies within USDA and then they have service delivery agencies and uh, the ones that uh, uh, we're talking about here today are the risk, th this is the, the risk management agency is the federal agency that comes up with crop insurance uh, policies and then crop insurance companies like Jeremy's uh, work with farmers to sell that crop insurance. The Farm Service Agency, which I'm sure that's the second one down there. I can't make my little pointer work. Anyway, Farm Service Agency, I'm sure you all know them because of loans. They have other disaster assistance programs. They are there to uh, dish out money for programs, depending on whether or not you qualify. And I am going to be ca uh, talking about a program that they have called the, um, whoops, the Non-Insured Assistance Program, after I talk about a few other things. Risk Management Agency, if you've had crop insurance and you have, um, uh, or you're already working on a transfer with your kids or a farm manager, you know that there can be things that don't work right for you. We, when you call me, when you call Jeremy, and you tell them about how your um, crop insurance did not work for you, we keep a list of those things and we do what we can to try to pressure the risk management agency to make uh, changes that work for New York State farmers. Believe it or not, we've gotten a few little changes. We don't get as far as we'd like. We do, however, uh, I have a great commissioner of ag who's slugging away at that farm credit um, and their various you know crop growers etc know what those changes need to be too and uh, people do lobby on your behalf when you let us know how those programs do not work and the only thing you have to do is be patient and also deal with uh, sometimes uh, quite literal lack of success because that also you know we try and we don't win but the risk management agency is creating these policies. The risk management agency could decide anytime they want to add prevented planting to uh, the few counties in New York where you can get cabbage uh, crop insurance. So we do work on that. The risk management agency also, in addition to creating these policies, they uh, work with Congress to come up with what you care about, which are the beginning farmer um, uh, incentives, really, to start crop insurance right away. So that's really what, what um, Jeremy was talking about. They do look over the shoulders of crop insurance companies. Um, crop growers is working with the big, large uh, 
reinsurance companies is what they are called that have bid on the opportunity to work with USDA and offer you guys crop insurance. But these crop insurance companies, when there's a problem, when they won't pay for something, let's say flooded field as, fields as a result of Irene or Lee, uh, it goes through a, a New York State adjudicatory process. It can go up to RMA. So they have multiple roles that can be a little tricky. But again, they're a federal agency. They're doing this. And the more we interact with them, I'm trying to say, you know, people complain to us about government. And I can say for sure, as a New York State employee, that most of those complaints, as far as our bureaucracy, are very legitimate. When it's programmatic, and it's the details of the programs, when we hear those things, we really do whatever we can to try to get them fixed. So I'm, I'm asking you to get involved in every way that you can. And that includes in these transfer programs. That's the Risk Management Agency. Today I'm here to talk about um, the beginning farmer as they affect transfers. Those programs run by the Farm Service Agency. Is there anybody here who does not know what the Farm Service Agency is, your county Farm Service Agency? I can't imagine it. It's, they're a, a way of life. Unfortunately, they're kind of, some of their offices are disappearing. Uh, they have a huge role in administering uh, disaster programs, in particular, zero on the red light, uh, the third bullet, disaster programs, and NAP, non-insured assistance program. Non-insured assistance program. If crop insurance is available for your crop in your county, that's how um, crop insurance is sold for every county in the United States, then NAP doesn't apply. So, corn. Corn silage, if you're growing corn or corn silage, it's insured in New York State, in almost every county. Uh, in case you don't remember, New York City is made up of five counties. So we kind of like don't count there. There's no corn there that I know of. Right, Jeremy? No corn that we know of. And you can see why crops fail. You know why crops fail. And the reason that crop insurance or NAP, the coverage I'm going to be talking about, are so good is that you can um, get a payment for reduced yield in 2012 because uh, we didn't get rain for two months. Uh, and you can get a payment for excess moisture in 2011, 2013. You know, it, it depends on the year. And it's based on yield. And this is really about um, weather-related payments. We're not talking about revenue here. That's a, a pretty important function. So now we're going to talk about NAP. This statement here is what the Farm Service Agency uh, says the purpose of NAP is. Has anybody here participated in NAP and gotten a payment? Okay, three, four people, five. Uh, I ask that because this is what I am calling the old NAP, what it uh, pays out as far as value. It's comparable to the disappointment crop insurance levels that Jeremy was talking about, which means you have to lose more than 50% of your crop. That's your you know, kind of your deductible. And then for any additional losses, they're only going to pay you at 55% of the value of that crop. So um, for many producers, that is an unhappy number. For others, they are happy. If you're in a floodplain and you signed up uh, 20 acres under NAP uh, for 30 crops, and you got flooded out at the beginning of August, and you got $30,000, I've had producers tell me they were happy with that amount. 
I've had other producers absolutely uh, complain from top to bottom about that level. And uh, the old NAP and new NAP do have um, issues as far as the criterion for your losses. So um, that's a factor as well. It's, it, it is not perfect. These are some of the details of NAP. Uh, you don't have to sell it. it it's not a, a, a market loss. There's a lot of details about NAP in your handout, so I'm not going to go through them too much because I do think you guys are going to have some real detailed questions for Jeremy and myself, and I think that'll be the most exciting part of the conversation. This is what we are calling the new NAP. So instead of that lousy, crummy, you know, 55% of the value of your crop after you've lost 50%, so if you have a 55% loss, you're going to get paid 5% of the value of the crop at 55%, not a lot of money. Now, in, because of the new farm bill, you can buy up, that's an expression associated with crop insurance, to levels that are higher and at 100% of the value of your crop. So let's say you are a dairy farmer and um, you've decided because of your fields and because of demand, right now there's a shortage, for instance, of dry beans in New York. People are not planting dry beans anymore, kidney beans. Very high value crop. If you're certified organic, people are pounding on your door to grow them. What are dry beans? They're kind of like soybeans. A risky, risky, risky crop. But, uh, and they're also, what are they? The, a, a very high value crop. And uh, someone was telling me that 60 years ago, that uh, five to 20 acre plot of dry beans was the mortgage payment for the farmer because that's really the, the value of the crop. However, ooh, you know, you don't harvest them at precisely the right morning uh, moment. They kind of drop on the ground when the combine uh, gets that brittle pot. I mean, there's a bazillion issues associated with them. But now, although there are a few places that you can, a few counties where you can actually ensure processing dry beans, you can insure them with NAP. And you can insure them at good levels, 65% at that 100 value level. Where do you do that? You do that with your farm service agency. What's the other thing that's terrific about NAP being extended to this buy-up? What you can insure. You can insure everything else. We, are, um, we have great crop insurance for corn. We have great crop insurance for 38 counties for soybeans. Um, whoops, that, that's some of the details. And we um, have, uh, uh, for many people, an unsatisfactory sweet corn policy for the whole state. And then after that, we don't have a lot of vegetable coverage at all. We do for some processing vegetables. But for vegetable growers, NAP is... Uh, uh, a product that can be really useful. What are you going to pay? You're going to pay real money for it. You have to have a valuable uh, crop to want to pay 5.25% uh, of the guarantee. Uh, but vegetables, as a rule, uh, especially those that are hand-picked, are really valuable. And uh, one of the things that's a key is that you can insure multiple crops. And uh, there are caps on what you end up paying. So if you insure 10, 20 vegetable crops, then you are all set as far as having a capped premium. And while your payment limit is 125000 if you think about how you're insuring your farm with NAP, that's your payment limit. 
And you know, you don't, you're not looking for uh, crop failures in five places or five crops. But if you get that one big failure on, let's say, your asparagus crop um, or whatever, then that could be your $125,000 payment there. There is going to be Christmas tree uh, and decent nursery nap coverage for the first time. There is a nursery crop insurance policy for wholesale producers. Jeremy, I don't know how many you sell. Do you sell a lot? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so this is important. Nursery is a huge component of uh, agricultural production in New York State. So that's a great addition to the NAP. Once you're buying up, you get some quality um, uh, considerations, very important for vegetables, and something that did not exist for that low level of NAP, the one you buy with just the administrative fee. And uh, quality is pretty big key. But you have to, quote, buy up to 55 to 65% coverage. Um, Records And here's the one thing I wanted to say about transfers. People are here for transfers. You're thinking about it. What's the most, let's say you're not doing crop insurance right now. You don't think it fits in or you're not doing NAP or you've never done NAP. If you have good records that can be verified either by a crop insurance agent, uh, which gets approved, you know, by the crop insurance companies, or by FSA, you can slip right in to good coverage, as can your transferee, your son, daughter, farm manager. It's all about good, verifiable records. And so the better records that you keep, the more accurate the yields are that you are then able to ensure. And it's that accuracy that allows you to actually um, value the crop at uh, what you are able to produce on that acreage. It's just, I would say it's one of the most pivotal things that exists. Jeremy is saying yes. Like everything else, there's an application period. And for vegetable producers, I just want to point out, because we don't have um, vegetable crop insurance here, I would say unless you're an onion grower, you don't have a clue that February 1 is an important date for sign up for vegetables. And so for NAP coverage uh, in counties where there is no onion coverage, uh, so onions as well as these other crops, you have to sign up with NAP by February 1. Everything else that's uh, seeded in the spring is March 15. There are a few other important dates that you know, you can think about later for NAP. Uh, these do parallel uh, crop insurance, September 30 in particular for fall seeded grains and then November 20 for fruits and vegetables. So um, we've got the money, there's the service fees. If you are straddling a couple of counties, you could, you could get whacked for uh, double the service fees. But otherwise, there's a nice cap per county. And this is the beginning farmer, parallel to crop insurance um, incentives to sign up for NAP, which is if you qualify as a beginning farmer, you get substantial reductions in what you pay. There is one little glitch I would say as far as consistency, beginning farmers for the purposes of NAP are defined for a 10-year period. You can be a beginning farmer for 10 years, which has been the uh, criterion that has been applicable for everything except crop insurance starting this year, which is now five years. And once again, you have to, you have to be the producer so this, as far as when you're working out these transfers with your kids and farm managers, 
you want to look at that eligibility to see how it works for you. Um, basically, if it's not insured under crop insurance, it is a NAP crop. This includes a few of these of the newer uh, biofuel. I don't know if anybody's growing any, any willow, et cetera, but those things are in there. These are the caps, 125 thou payment, not for what you can insure for. The rules, keep in touch with FSA, track anything that you communicate, make sure that you keep a record of that communication. That parallels crop insurance. And uh, I would add one last thing here. Uh, our Farm Service Agency, like all federal agencies, they're still having to deal with sequestration. Uh, last year, offices consolidated. So anything that you can do to um, work with them, understanding that uh, we believe we have a, uh, uh, a staffing shortfall at the FSA county level, um, Help them out if you can, because we want them, we need them, and, and uh, that's a component of things. Just if they say you have to be there between 10 and 12 only one day a week. It's a total drag, but hopefully we'll get by this and, and their funding will increase in future years. We hope so. Jeremy, come on up. Is this how we should do this, Dan? Yeah. We will. Oh, ho, ho, we both went over. Well, we started a little bit later, too. Sandy. Uh, oh, so I was going to ask about the to sign up for NAP? What does your buyer have to do with it? The buyer's going to be the one that's going to be taking over the farm? Was the buyer uh, producing grain elsewhere? I think that's the key. The buyer part of it is irrelevant. If that producer was... Uh, I, I, Absolutely. If he was farming for 10 or 11 years in another state and came into New York State, uh, no. So where they're located is irrelevant. It is where they are. It is that length of time where they had, quote, that insurable interest. So if that individual was um, a farm hand and never got any uh, uh, payments from NAP for crop insurance and did not have uh, an insurable interest in a crop. You know, like they said, all right, I'm getting paid a bonus when this crop comes in. Then it's not a factor. Mike, um, on your uh, insured crops, you know, it's got pasture, range plant, and forage. Would that include dry hay then? That would, yes. Yeah, so under the pasture, rangeland, forage program, it's um, hayland, grazing land, that's covered under the under that policy. Of the 600 cases that you've written or sold or whatever, how many people have ever actually got paid to drive hay? Um, pasture, rangeland, forage is a program that's not dri not um, uh, really farm driven. It's it, There's a grid and it's a lack of moisture, so it's really a drought policy. Um, the pasture rangeland forage has its benefits. It does have a uh, loss history that producers have received more than the program has paid in, but it doesn't cover quality. It doesn't cover excess moisture. It really is driven by the deviation of, of rainfall. 
from not having enough rainfall. So when we talk about the pasture rangeland forage program, it really is a sit down, setting proper expectations and understand no quality coverage under that program. Well, that's that because be it's not. Yeah, that might be FSA's program. The pasture rangeland forage under crop insurance does not. And that's, we are in the process now, uh, now that we're getting, we're, we're getting the NAP handbook this week, we think, about what is covered. The pasture rangeland forage crop insurance is very limited, but it's crop insurance. And because it's limited just to drought, NAP coverage for um, pasture, well, grazing isn't so great, but for hay is something very important to look into. And it does qua uh, cover quality. So it's important, but it's NAP, not crop insurance, the, uh, that your FSA agent was talking about. Under the pasture rangeland forage program? Uh, under no. the crop insurance NAP. or under NAP? So I'm thinking See? under NAP, I would say yes. Under the pasture rangeland forage crop insurance program, no. Yeah. So you're choosing between two different things. Why is there pasture rangeland forage crop insurance available in, you know, every county and NAP hay coverage? Because PRF, the, that crop insurance we're talking about, is what's called single peril. It only deals with drought. Uh, and so you can sign up at your FSA office for NAP buy-up. You know, you have to go more than 50% coverage to get hay quality coverage. And they ought to be able to spell that out for you. Also, uh, we didn't say here, but you, for both NAP and for crop insurance, you can go to the websites uh, either with an agent or just, you know, at your own computer and figure out some of this stuff, like NAP coverage in your county for hay and what the value of that would be. Hard to keep straight, these two different things. But um, the NAP coverage for hay and mixed forages, much better than the crop insurance for alfalfa because it's mixed forages. And there's some real criterion for getting hay covered uh, in New York State with crop insurance. So do look at the NAP for that. Good, good, thank you. Good conversation on that. Yes. Yeah. Please. Great question. Um, uh, there is a linkage requirement, but it has changed in recent years. Double check with the Farm Service Agency on the new linkage requirement. And the main driving force behind that was to be eligible for crop disaster programs. And the really, uh, that was the previous farm bill where it was the FSA SURE program. Uh, where that's no longer in place, uh, the FSA SURE program is not in force. So double check with your farm service agency to see if you have a requirement for purchasing crop insurance. We're not seeing that today, um, but you want to hear that answer directly from them because you don't want to take yourself out of any eligibility for any of their programs. Good question. Yeah. Great question. Um, I don't think our federal government, well, let, let um, two, two points to that because I think that's very important. 2012 was the first, was with the national drought, with a significant drought, um, there was not a cry from the Midwest for crop disaster programs. If there was, that was the year for it to happen. Crop insurance did exactly what it was supposed to do. It met the need of the farmer to protect their investment. No cry for a crop disaster program. So that's one true recent example where there could have been a call for one, was not a call. Number two, 
from a financial standpoint from our federal government, I don't believe that we're in a situation. Uh, that's why you're seeing the continued commitment. Congress made a strong commitment to the federal crop insurance program in the 2014 Farm Bill. That is where they are committed to, to supporting um, production agriculture. I don't see that changing. Uh, now, I don't have a crystal ball, but I do not see the future disaster programs. On the other hand, um, there was a disaster program for livestock that in when the Farm Bill was passed uh, a year ago last February, they allowed farmers to retroactively sign up for. And that was because of the 2012-2013 drought and what it did <clears throat> to livestock producers largely in the, this is the Kansas, Oklahoma, uh, Texas area. And so FSA did sign people up for that retroactively. And New York State got the benefit of uh, farmers being able to sign up for um, the SURE program retroactively for fruits. That was like berries and stuff for that 2012 year. So in this past farm bill, that's how they dealt with farmers and disaster programs for losses if you had not been signed up. Would that happen again? It would, I, I believe it would only potentially happen depending on how uh, lobbyists for state, individual state uh, farmers were able to fare in the next farm bill, but nothing in between. Great. We're we're at the uh, at the 9:15 mark. So we're uh, we're at the mark. A any last questions? Okay. Thank you for your time. Have a great rest of the day. <laughs>